is an interesting theme we had this month of November, untethered from fear. I figured it would be Thanksgiving or gratitude or something like that for the month of November, but no. <laughs> the Science of Mind magazine, uh, we align with their themes. And so this month's theme was untethered from fear. And we began the month with fear. Remember F-E-A-R? Forget everything and run. No. False evidence appearing real. False evidence appearing real. And we're ending, we're ending with face everything and rise. Isn't that lovely? Face everything and rise. Much better approach, don't you agree? Okay, so anybody here afraid of sharks? Afraid of sharks? Anybody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's a shark there. A lot of people, a lot of people are afraid of sharks. Just, just going to the beach for some people can start the music in your head, can it? Right? You know what? In this country, one person a year gets killed by a shark. One. We stand a better chance of being killed by a deer in this country. 38 people a year get killed by deer, right? One, one person gets killed by a shark. We have, actually, we only have a one in 1.4 million chance of being killed by any animal in this country. We stand a better chance of getting struck by lightning than being killed by an animal. There are so many more common ways to die. <laughs> and yet, we're afraid of, we're, we have these irrational fears of sharks, right? It is the movie, isn't it? It's the movie we saw. Kind of got into the collective, you know, consciousness of this country. And that's the thing about fear. That's the thing about fear. It is the anticipation of something happening. It's not what's happening. Right? We extrapolate. That's what fear is. We extrapolate. If I go to the beach, <laughs> and if I decide to go into the water, and if there are sharks nearby, and if, oh, my stupid mic is making weird noise again. Hang on a sec. OK. And if I attract sharks, I might get bitten. It's all extrapolating. It's all about the future. It's all about something that's not happening. It means the thing we're afraid of is not occurring. You know, Mark Twain said, some of the worst moments in my life never happened. <laughs> I love it. The thing we're afraid of is not happening. It doesn't currently exist. Fear is a way for us to suffer from something that's not even real. That's what fear does. That's what fear is. And so there is, there is a difference between fear and danger, right? So when we say face everything and rise, confront your fear and overcome it, what's going on with this thing? Do you hear that? I hear it. Do you hear it? Hang on a sec. Can I fix it? Maybe. Anyway, when we say face everything and rise, confront your fear, right? Stop letting it hold you back. Now, if your fear is, like say, snakes, I'm not going to tell you, jump into that pit of rattlesnakes. Get over that fear. Confront those things, right? Because that's not confronting your fear. That's putting yourself in danger. There is a difference. There's a difference between overcoming your fears and placing yourself in dangerous situations. Will Smith said this. He said, fear is not real. It is the product of your thoughts, and you create it. Don't, don't misunderstand me. Danger is very real, but fear is a choice. Right? So if your fear of snakes is keeping you from leaving the house in the morning, then that's a reasonable thing to want to work to overcome. You see the difference? OK. Ernest Holmes said this. He said, most of our fears are based on some sense of uncertainty, something that makes us feel we are not quite safe. We do not belong either to society or to the world in which we live. Fear takes the joy out of living. And if it dominates us, it makes everything we do ineffective. So fear limits us. It holds us back. Fear can be that anxiety that keeps us from experiencing a more self-actualized life. And when the fear rises up within us, a lot of times we do something to keep that fear at bay, right? This is a coping mechanism. And a lot of times we do that. When, when the fear comes up 
inside of us will go off and we do something different. In the, the Fear to Faith worksheets, has anybody, you've worked them, right, in foundations class, and we use them again in um, financial freedom. We have these, these worksheets for, called Fear to Faith, and we talk about this. When the fear rises up in us, we have a tendency to try to push it away or do something else. This is our coping mechanism to keep us from actually really from going through it. I mean, we come up to it and then we, then we take like a side path and we do something else to keep us from feeling the fear. And, and, and that thing we do, that coping mechanism, it, it actually keeps us from revealing the ultimate truth within us that we really need to break through. So, so say, for example, someone has a fear of lack. Right? Lack, not enoughness. They will do something. When that feeling starts coming up within them, they'll do something to try to smash that feeling down, to try to get rid of it. And, and you know, sometimes if people have feelings of not enoughness, they go shop. Sure, why not? Spend money you don't have because that makes you feel like you have it. You see what I'm saying? It's a, it's a, it's a coping mechanism. So if you're feeling like you're not enough, some people will go shop. Uh, pretend like there is no, no lack, you know? Other people will drink or do drugs, right? Numb that feeling so that they don't have to feel it. Some people sleep. Some people go underground. You know, you, you, call, you have submarine friends. Does anybody have submarine friends when stuff gets, you know, when stuff starts getting real, you don't see or hear from them for weeks at a time? Yeah. Yep, that's what happens. Some people just go unconscious like that. Other people become too busy. Yeah, I know you have friends like that too, right? I got a million and a half things. I can't think about this thing. I can't blow through my own fear because I have all this stuff I have to do. All this stuff I have to do. So that pushing away behavior, that coping mechanism keeps us from growing. We get right up to the fear. We get right up to our growing edge. And then we take, a, we take a turn. And we do something else so we don't have to go through it. It keeps us from addressing the limiting or the false belief and transforming it. We keep doing the same thing over and over. We come right up to the point of transformation. And then we back down. And we let the fear keep us small. And Joseph Campbell said, we must give up the light weight. We must give up the life we planned in order to have the life that is waiting for you. You must give up the life you planned in order to live the life that is waiting for you. And that life that's waiting for you, it's on the other side of that fear. It's on the other side of that thing you dare not do. And Ernest Holmes said it this way, the quickest and most effective method to get rid of fear is to get quiet and lift up the whole thought in confidence and faith to something bigger than you are. I love that quote. He goes on to say, it's like going from the cold, dark room into the sunshine and just sitting there, letting the rays of the sun penetrate your whole being with warmth and color until the darkness and the dampness are gone. So it is the life of prayer and faith, of affirmative meditation, and of communion with the divine spirit, which is closer to us than our very breath. So it's just a remembering of who we are. It is remembering that with God, we are a majority, right? The best way to beat fear, to overcome it, to transform it, is to face everything and rise. We need to take the next step, whatever that is. It doesn't have to be a big, gigantic thing. It's just the next step of whatever you're afraid of. Just take the next step. You know, the thing, the thing about humans is that we get bored with stuff. Right? Do you get bored doing the same thing over and over and over again, the routine thing? Now, here's the thing about that. When we do the same thing over and over and over and over and over, it's called habituation, right? So it doesn't get a rise out of us. It doesn't excite our nervous system. We don't get aroused by doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over. That's why marriage counselors, you know, if you've ever gone to a marriage counselor, they always tell you, do something different. <laughs> Spice it up. <laughs> Dark night. What I'm saying is, you know, the little, the little French maids out there. Anyway, oh. you know, no. <laughs> because what happens is the same old, same old, same old, right? And so it fails to elicit that arousal response. So you have to try something new. Now, we know this is true. We know with repeated exposure, we, we are, our reactions decrease. Even babies, even with babies, they become overly familiar with the same old toy. You keep giving them the same toy, the same toy, the same toy. And there is not an arousal response until they're shown something different. And 
That's what we need to do, right? Show them something different. Their whole little nervous system lights up when they're presented with a new toy. Now, when it comes to our limiting fears, we have a tendency to want to avoid them, which is exactly what we should not be doing. You see, because if we avoid them, then when they come up, what is it? We get that startled response. We get that, elicit, that, that high reaction. We get that nervous arousal because we're busy avoiding it. In order to bore your nervous system, you need to repeatedly expose yourself to the thing that you're afraid of. Does that make sense? So that it becomes the same old, same old. You, that repeated exposure to the thing you're afraid of creates that, that feeling, that habituation in your nervous system so that the stimulus no longer elicits the same startle response or the same anxiety or the same fear. It no longer provokes fear in us because it's just, oh, same old, same old. The cure to our fear, the anxiety that rises up in us when we're in the presence of that limiting belief is to keep exposing ourselves to the thing we're afraid of. Until we're no longer afraid of it, we're just bored with it. That's it. Oh, that thing again? Oh, that same old snake? Oh, that spider? Whatever. We can't even get excited. It doesn't, it doesn't elicit that same excited, startled response. I know it sounds kind of counterintuitive, but we overexpose ourselves to those things that we're afraid of, and then they're just, we're just no longer afraid of them. Exposure works way better than avoidance. Avoidance just locks the anxiety in place. Does that make sense? Remember, re re what we resist persists, right? What we resist persists. What we embrace, we can transform. That's the other part of that saying. And what we embrace, we can transform. Ernest Holmes said this. He said, fear is the great enemy of man. It is impossible for a person to do his best when he's filled with anxiety. Unless we live without fear today, we will dread tomorrow. We don't want to live our lives in fear and in dread and in anxiety. It, we are here to live the fully self-actualized life of spirit that we know ourselves to be. Fully self-actualized life. Big, grand, beautiful, great life, embracing everything. Our soul wants that connection. Our soul craves experience. It doesn't, it doesn't limit highs and lows or goods or bads or judges. Your soul just craves experience and connection and, and, and all that life has to offer. Fear sucks that out of us. You know what I'm saying? It limits us. Um, Star Trek. Anybody, any Trekkies? Are there any Trekkies? Okay. You know, Star Trek, Star Trek Next Generation, Star Trek Voyager, Star Trek, there's another one. I don't remember the name of it. Okay, Captain Janeway. It was, a, it was one of the episodes. Fear exists for only one singular purpose, to be conquered. That is awesome. Fear, fear exists for only a single purpose, to be conquered. Captain Janeway. So this is what we do. This is our life. This is what anything that limits us, we want to grow beyond. We want to heal to know our wholeness, to know our, our magnificence. Face everything and rise takes discernment. You know, what is fear and what is danger and what is the anxiety we have around both of them? We have to understand that fear is, is a primal thing. It is within us. It's in that reptilian brain. It's right there. Eat, sleep, reproduce. It's right there at the top of our spinal column. That reptilian brain, even though we've created this lovely, beautiful you know, cerebral cortex uh, over and above it, that reptilian brain still exists. We have to understand it is within us, the amygdala, and it is there to keep us alive. It is meant to save our lives, and it does a darn good job of it, too, I have to say. <laughs> you know, we, something came up, we ran, or we fought, right? Fight or flight, right? That's where that comes from. But, you know, there are no woolly mammoths around. There are no saber-toothed tigers out there, you know, in the parking lot anymore, you know? <laughs> you know, when, when you, again, you know, if you're afraid of being bitten by a snake, do not jump into a pit of, of rattlesnakes, you know? We know that. That's a present danger. That's a present danger. That goes beyond fear. That's a difference. But if you're afraid of writing that book, or you're afraid of finishing writing that book, because you're afraid it's going to get rejected by the, uh, the publishing company, 
or worse yet, it gets accepted and then it doesn't sell. <laughs> or worse yet, it gets, you get, it gets accepted and sells and then it's ridiculed by the reviewers, right? If you're, if you're afraid of all that stuff, then your fear is limiting you. And it needs to be overcome. It's holding you back from your greater yet to be. Ernest Holmes said, fear and unhappiness can be successfully overcome only by another and opposite inward something greater than fear. There is no permanent healing of fear without a restoration of faith in the invisible. Right? So we have to grow through it. We can't just keep getting up to fear and then making that U-turn and using those coping mechanisms. They don't get us beyond our self-imposed limitations. Which leads me to some practical tools we can use to overcome fear, to face everything and rise, right? First is identifying the fear. What is the fear? Is it heights? Is it dark places? Is it claust are you claustrophobic? Is it snakes, spiders, dogs? Identifying the fear. And, and all of that extrapolating, right, that goes on around that fear. If I go to the water, and if I go into the ocean, and if there are snakes, but all that, all that extra, da -da 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 -da, you know, <sighs> extrapolating all of it. So here's the thing I'm afraid of, and why, and why, and what are all the things around all of that that I'm afraid of? Now, if you're running down a hiking trail, and you're being chased by a bear, you can skip this step. OK? Because you're not identifying your fear. You're in danger. You are in danger. You know, get out, OK? But, but that's really the first step, is identifying the fear. And then reframing it. After identifying the fear, we have to understand this too shall pass. Right? I am afraid of this thing, but this thing is occurring only in my head. It's a thought. And like every other thought I have, it comes and goes. Every other thought I have, it too shall pass. God is bigger than our fear. And then you have to ask yourself, is the fear true? Is this true? Is this really, really true for me? Or is this just a thought I'm having in my head? You know? Is this fear simply excitement? A lot of fear we have is really just excitement wearing a mask. <laughs> you know? Some people are terrified of public speaking. It's butterflies, it's excitement, it's, it's, what happens if you get up and you speak publicly and what? And you forget what you're going to say? Or, uh, I don't know, people laugh or something? Yeah, there's nothing that's going to happen to you. You're not physically going to die if you blow a talk, right? It's that kind of thing. We have to, uh, we have to know, is the fear just in, in my head? Of course it is. Is the fear just some imaginary thing is going to happen? Again, extrapolating, of course it is. You know, the excitement of the big date. Has anybody ever had that? You're, you finally get that date with that person that like, oh my God, you've been wanting to date and you've had the crush on for so long and you're like so excited and what should I wear? And you change outfits like 19 different times and you fix your makeup and then you take the makeup off and you fix it again and your hair and all that kind of stuff and your adrenaline is up here. There is no difference physiologically in your body if you're going out on that first date or you know someone's coming over to kill you. <laughs> it's the same exact chemicals that are going off in your body. You have to understand that it's like that, that fight or flight response. Yeah, it's not even funny. So it's about reframing it. It's about reframing it. <laughs> and here's another way of reframing it, asking your future self, asking your future self, how are you feeling if you don't push through the fear? and you never experience that thing you want to experience. How are you going to feel in six months from now, nine months from now, a year from now? I didn't do it. I didn't do it. You know, we regret more things that we didn't do than the things we do experience, right? So how, you know, you ask your future self when you're reframing. Am I going to regret this? <laughs> yeah, probably, you know. Check in with your future self. If I don't overcome this fear and I let myself stay small, What's, what's the payoff there? And then the next thing we do is we name it and claim it. We get to the point where fear hurts us more than it protects us. Right? I mean, that's what our fear is for. It's to protect us. It's to keep us alive, keep us safe, keep from running into ongoing traffic, keep from standing in front of an oncoming train. But it also keeps us small. 
So we get to the point where the fear hurts us more than it protects us. And we have to call it out for what it is. Fear is a liar. There, I said it. <laughs> fear is a liar. Fear is the lizard language. It's the lizard language in our brain. It's the critical parent. It is whatever it is. You know, whatever you want to call it, call it what you want. But call it out for what it is. It's that imaginary thing that lives in your head that tries to keep you safe. Well, you know what could happen. Well, you know what can happen, right? How many times did your parents ever say that? Oh, don't do that. You know what? You can fall down to the tree and break your arm. Yes, but I could climb the tree and have a wonderful day, <laughs> you know? It's always about, right, what could happen? What could happen? Again, extrapolating. So we have to call it out for what it is. Fear is a liar. It's just an imaginary story we have in our head. Nothing has happened. Nothing has happened. And then what we do after we call it out is we claim our truth. We claim our truth. We call on our faith and we name it. We name the truth within us that we know, that seed of perfection that is nestled within us, the spirit within us that wants to experience all that life has to offer. I call mine my inner earnest. Okay, <laughs> we invite that inner truth to stomp out the fear. The inner truth is greater than anything that can possibly happen in the world of conditions. Deep down, I know my God is bigger than any storm, right, that the world of conditions can whip up. My inner God is greater than any, inner, than any outer condition. And then the next thing you want to do is, is surround yourself with your tribe. And here we are. This is us. This is why we get together on Sunday. This is why we don't just watch it on live streaming. I know we don't have live streaming yet, but, <laughs> but if we do, you know, this is why we get dressed and we come in and we're together because we support each other. Find your tribe. Hang with your tribe. When, when we do that, we, we lift each other up. Call your practitioner. Who, who has a practitioner on retainer? Who, who, who? Yes, 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 a couple more. You, you all need one. <laughs> you know, you forget the truth of who you are sometimes. Don't you? Do you? Am I the only one? OK, sometimes you get into condition and you go, oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? You know? No, you're not going to do anything because spirit does it through you anyway. So you call your practitioner in that moment. Oh my, I'm seeing you know, something here, and I'm getting all caught up in the condition, and I can't find God in, the, in this. I can't find God in this, tr in this, this condition. You call your practitioner. Get a practitioner on retainer. <laughs> oh, look, I know. There's a, there's a bulletin. We make these every week. We hand them out. Look, they have prayer requests in them. You know what's on the back of the prayer request? A list of practitioners. <laughs> okay, call them. Put one on retainer. Call your practitioner when you lose sight of the truth, when you have forgotten who you are. They remember for you. Change conditions around you. Call your minister. My phone number's on there. Call me. Call your life coach. Who has life coaches? You have life coaches? Call your life coach. Take spiritual enrichment classes. They continue to remind us of who we are when we forget. Because when we remember who we are, we're not afraid of anything. Are you ever afraid of anything when you come out of one of, one of Vision's classes? You come out and you're like, right? <laughs> Captain Vision. <laughs> I'm not afraid of anything. I know who I am. But we forget. We forget. So you take spiritual classes. Do your meditation. Don't you come out of meditation the same way? When you sit on your meditation cushion, whether or not you want to, make it a daily practice, whether or not, grab the meditation cushion, sit on it. We're sitting around waiting for nothing to happen. And we do it for a given amount of time. When you come out of it, you feel better. I can do anything. Yes, you can, because you're God in form. So you, you, you do your meditation. You make that a spiritual practice. You do visualization. You do affirmative prayer. You know when you come out of affirmative prayer, it's the same way. I love the picture we use for the chamber of prayer. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Uh, they, they're like little kittens going into the chamber of prayer, and then they're big lions coming out. You know, It's like, yes, that's exactly how we feel, right? When we are prayed up, we know the truth of us. We're not afraid of anything, nothing, hope. I love the word hope. A lot of people don't like the word hope, but hope is have only positive expectations. Have only positive expectations, and that's what we do. That's what we do. That's what our spiritual practice does. It lifts us up. We are fearless. We're fearless. Keep stepping out of your comfort zone. That's something else. 
Be on that growing edge. And don't take the U-turn. Don't take the left or the right turn into your coping mechanism. Be on your growing edge and then go through it. As Ernest Holmes, there was something written about, oh shoot, I don't have the quote here, but there was a, in one of the books he, he wrote, he said, a gentleman had come to him and had a dream. And he said, in the dream, this giant monster, you know, was bearing down on him and rah, you know. And the, and the man was like, oh my God, what are you going to do with, what are you going to do to me? And the big monster said, I have a clue, this is your dream, you know. <laughs> What are you going to do to me? <laughs> you know, that's fear. That's fear. We have to face everything and rise because we become more of who we are. We become more of who we truly are in spirit when we rise, when we face everything and rise. There is nothing to fear, right? And there's no other part to that. I know, uh, yeah, I know Roosevelt said there was another part, but there isn't. There is nothing to fear. He said what, but fear itself, right? But no, there is nothing to fear. That's it. There is nothing to fear. Face all of it. Face it all and rise. Thank you so much. Thank you.